you've reached the phone in the block direction, but please leave a message. Shit. Y'all know where I am. My memories are very like colorful and like sensory of when I was a kid here and the sun like on the beach, the heat, the sand. I'm not sure if I'm imagining it, but I think that my oldest memory is being at the tower or somewhere on the beach in the sand and I must have been really young and I just ran straight into the water. There was someone paddling in and it must have been dad. Looking through the water, I, I don't think I could swim and he just scoops me up and puts me on the board. Don't worry about mud or anything like that. I just, I track it in and I wipe it off. Don't worry about it. Tell us a little bit about that wooden board. This wooden one, it's built like a ship and it's a brewer. I actually got one of the best rides in my memory on this board. A very vertical down the stove pipe drop in on a big wave, which I'll never forget. So I'd say in my life is one of the best, one of the best five waves was on this board. What about the photo we got right here? Oh, that's Emmy at Jaws. On the wave, she's self-destructed on when she, that thing slipped out or whatever it did. It was a quad. So I see every time I look at it, I say, God, if she'd just been on a single fin, if she'd, you know, been more of coming in this direction, but it would have caught her anyway. So, and there's a picture of Emmy, the first one in the North Shore News at Waimea. This is a place where Emily was born out of that little room right under there. In 89, me and uh, the wife, Allison, lived in that little room right there, so. That's where Emily came into the world and then right down that little right away is where we would go to the beach and she'd jump on her skate or boogie board and we'd all hang out. It was a good stay while we were here. My connection with the ocean is through Emily at this point. And it's a, a great thing to just watch her go through the pleasure of surfing. I mean, I think she enjoys the ocean in much uh, broader ways than I ever did. about Emmy is it's in her blood. She has the most unique style that you could ever watch. The way she does her bottom turns, her positioning. She's got a real ability to find the peaks of waves, especially at a place like Sunset, which is just a wild, very long, drawn out lineup and waves are swinging in from all directions. But if you notice, she's always right in the perfect spot. It's just, it's cool to watch. It's almost like this really old school style slash longboard grace in big wave surfing. And she rides single fins still, which almost no young people are really doing anymore, especially in big waves. It's really interesting when Emmy shows up and everybody's on like the latest quad setup and, and she's showing up with her single fin gun every time. Pretty much seems like she rides the same board 90% of the time.
You yeah. would like come in to have lunch and I'm like pissed off because I'm hostessing at some stupid restaurant. I don't over think it. I, I don't think I was taking you seriously as like a charger yet. No, of course not. No, no, no. It, you didn't even know. So you're, you're like, I'm gonna shape you a board. I'm like, yeah, I yeah, like keep you, it you moving. Only had, you only had this one at that time. I only had this one and yeah. a soft top. Yeah. Right, right. And that's your dad's old board, right? Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. The single fin is is really the bow hunting of surfing, right? We're in the era of, well, the leash first off, and then the inflation suit, the safety crew. But I think like Roger and that generation was no leash. Like if you're gonna catch a huge wave, you kind of need to complete the ride, right? And if you lose your board, you need to be able to swim in and out and like rescue yourself. So I feel like Emmy's kind of a throwback to that. Especially Jaws, like paddling, I was impressed by that. Because paddling Jaws is rough. You know, even had, when I ate it? Even when you ate it, because <laughs> You're like- You're probably more proud when I ate it. <laughs> yeah, because just to send it, you, you know, like, it's blind. You're like looking down a three-story building and there's just nothing but air. So if you just jump to your feet, that's like, you know, a lot of faith just to even go. No? I don't know how I talk myself into Jaws. The guys that I'm rolling around with chasing swells we're at every single spot and Emmy would pop up here and there because it's harder for her. She has a full-time job. It's not like she's making a crazy living off of professional surfing. I definitely struggle with the competitive side of surfing. We've only really had a handful of events for women, but I would say trying to take something I'm so passionate about and put it all into like half an hour or an hour and really show that. It's a little bit of a battle in my mind. So I got invited to the first Jaws uh, contest. The day they had the contest, um, we were there early. It was big and scary. And it was really windy. It was tough. And Emmy's heat went in the water. Get in the water, first thing, they're, you know, just get the jersey, go. Didn't get to look at the waves. It's a tough learning curve for anybody. Like, Jaws is just a different velocity. There's different factors involved and to show up and just surf in a heat, it's tough. And I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna go on anything. As Soon as I thought that set rolls in, I see a ramp on, I don't know, maybe the second wave. And I go and the wind's already howling at that time. My ACL and MCL instantly, both of them ripped off the bone. My quad was torn and part of my calf was detached as well. My leg was just a, a noodle, like spaghetti noodle. There was no, there was no way I could walk or stand on a board. So I had ACL and MCL surgeries to reattach both the ligaments back to the knee. And that's a lesson that always sticks with me every single day. I listened to what a lot of people were saying at the time. They were basically saying, you can't ride a single fin, a jaws successfully. I wasn't really sticking to my guns when I should have. So I always think of that and I remember that I, that I have to. When you get so injured and you don't know if you're going to do something again. I mean, you know you will, but, you know, the same way. I still deal with it. I still feel it. I try to push past it. Or even getting, like, injured and then coming back. Yeah. I thought you were going to just be like, that's it, I'm done. But, I mean, maybe at the end of the day, it's, like, mental strength, which I think that comes from Roger. These are optimal, and I kind of made them myself because the ones that they made, I 
I didn't like. So I just uh, get this little doogie here, which is a great support. And then these support really good from this angle. And you know, and you can just do a ton of these things. And then um, I got stuff here. I got a, a load. This is the first thing in the morning. And, it, and I get a, a rotational pull on every muscle in the neck. It helps with headaches a lot. I was born in 1946, picked up a board in 1960 and got here in the winter of 1965, 66. It was nice, you just grabbed your board and, and you'd find a bar of wax on the beach somewhere. Eddie Icao and his dad would park, maybe cooking some hot dogs over a little hibachi. The young boys, young men are looking for challenges and that seemed to be the only challenge in town was to go to uh, test your metal at Wyoming. At the time, that was the bar that was set. Roger was the dominant figure on the North Shore, and he was really powerful, and he charged. And his boards were always white with this black stripe on them, so he was really identifiable. And he, his style just matched, you know, heavy, heavy seas. Roger Erickson is a man who I used to have pictures of on my wall as a kid. He approached big waves the same way Kelly Slater surfs a small wave, and that's unheard of. Roger is one of the original, like, cowboys on the North Shore. And back in that day, too, if you're somebody who could hang, be a lifeguard and a big wave surfer and accepted by everybody being a Holly guy that did, that's not born and raised in Hawaii, like, you know, he earned it probably twice as much as everybody else did. It's a little strange being the daughter of someone who's like so otherworldly to other people. And then that's the way people understand it is that, oh, her dad did it, so she does it. Some people say things like it's in your blood and that kind of stuff, which kind of bothers me actually a little bit because I, I don't really, I'm like, no, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the one only out there taking sets on the head. But at the same time, there is something undeniable that I can't really put words to. This one, this one. Excellent. Oh, he pulled back. Okay. Um, binocular. Sides. Oh, no. He ate it too. At the start. There's a set. Yeah, the, the outside one. Surfing has been the bridge of communication, you know, between myself and my father. And it's kind of like softened up this, you know, hard situation between us all. I have a picture of my dad surfing. I'm gonna get it out, because I've never really shown it to anybody. Okay, there's me and Greg Knoll playing Knuckles in 1965-66 winter. Where are you, Dad? Here's my my war partner. He he's dead, but he got he got a through and through, right through the chest in, a far, in this uh, little scramble we got into. Well, he is, that was my trail buddy. A little Sicilian Italian guy, the toughest guy. I'm taking a picture for the Bronze Star. They just popped on me. But you can see it a little bit. I never even noticed it. A landmine went off and 
kind of popped us both. And, and so uh, the guy would all just turn into a sheet of flame. And I picked up myself and chased him down and smothered him out, you know. And then I um, don't remember a whole much after that. <laughs> so. I do remember waking up and looking down and seeing Vietnam sliding on by off the side of one, the gurney because it was an open gurney on the side of the chopper. That was kind of cool. Wow, because they had me all morphed up. See, so a couple weeks in the uh, medevac, and uh, I stole some crutches and some clothes and split that place and went back to my unit. Vietnam and to put yourself into that position where you, you have to fight for your life and the trauma that comes with it and then you, you come home and you, you, you have a wife and you have children, it's not normal. It's be the hardest act to follow to, to, to come out of that and to, to try to live a normal life with all these scars in your mind. And having the mom and the children deal with Roger is not normal. It's not a good thing to, to have to go through. I know that it was traumatic. And I see the effect on him now. And it's definitely shaped my life and his life, my sisters, my mom. It's not easy to be married. It's not easy to make a minimum wage job. It's not easy to raise three children. Along the way, Roger's wife left. And um, she moved back to Virginia, and she took all the little girls with them. Times were difficult. Things were, things were hard, you know. Dad had gone to war and had really gnarly PTSD. You know, my mom is super free and artistic and loves music, and, and she's this, this small, petite woman, but she has nerves of steel and more willpower than you can ever imagine. And she raised myself and my sisters on our own after, you know, my family basically split apart. Emily had a, I'd say she had a tough life early child because she got removed from the North Shore, which was her home. So she had to kind of help uh, raise the kids, her two sisters. So I don't know if you call that a latchkey kid or what, but because I was not around. I spent all my time taking care of my sisters. I never went to a high school party. I never had a high school boyfriend. I never had a sip of alcohol. I was like just the sister that took care of the younger sisters, and I did all the academic stuff, straight-A student. That was my whole life before, you know, before I was 18, and then right before I turned 18, I came back out here on a, an environmental science scholarship to UH. I didn't have a car or anything, and I would just take the bus up here to the North Shore every chance I got, and I would even just skip school. I just wanted to be where I resonated. So I would come and I only had a boogie board, so I would paddle out at sunset, or like kick my way out at sunset. I loved being in the water, and then I became absolutely obsessed with surfing. You know, funny enough, it was just the, the perfect way to start communicating with Dad, and there was such a long period of time, a gap there, that we weren't really around each other because there was very little communication for those years. We had something in common. We had common ground. It was just like a, a geez, a reunion, a grand reunion, and life started up again, kind of in a whole different genre. 
uh, because I had a, a daughter that was here in Hawaii. I feel like I had a lot of like childhood still to live. So when I came back, I feel like I kind of had a second childhood, kind of like trying to figure out what that look, looks like on my own. Surfing is such a blessing in my life and it's like, you know, the, a, a means of expression, it's a means of living and really feeling connected to things. It just so happened that it also really helped things, you know, with my family and I feel like has changed things for all of us. It's been said many ways, <laughs> but Sunset is a mean mistress. <laughs> Can be. It's always the West sets that get me, though. Yeah. Like the building sure. West. They're powerful. And when the current kicks in, and then you're like just behind that West Peak, you're like, oh no. Imagine what I'm thinking, knowing how bad you're getting ragdolled <laughs> when you do that stuff. Yeah, do you get nervous? Well, my heart wants to just go <laughs> sometimes. Or just like mountains of white water. It's, it's worrisome having a daughter like you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's not worrisome. <laughs> oh God, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I basically told myself I wasn't gonna go back to Jaws at all. But then I was really broke and I couldn't pay the rent, so I went to Jaws again, and I had both of the same boards as options to ride. I had the quad that I had wiped out on that previous time, and I had my trusty Black Stripe 10 6 single fin. I just like, I was like, well, screw it. If I'm gonna like, if I'm gonna, do this, I'm doing it my way. Her heat went into the water and she came by me and said, what do you think, W? And I said, make your waves, don't fall off. No one was making waves. It was, I don't know what was going on. It was like humongous and everyone's trying to figure out where to sit. And it was just really intimidating. She caught every wave that she could she made every wave that she stood up on. I swear to God, she won the contest. exactly what I wanted to do and it, it was it was definitely a moment for me to realize I still could do it it's been very difficult sometimes to like recognize like my own power and step into it and be like confident in that because I don't know it's, life's not easy I don't know if life's easy for anyone but I get to do this crazy thing I have a passion for being in the ocean. You know, it's taken me all around the world. I feel like a lot of people who really gravitate towards the ocean, like they really get some kind of healing from it and then, you know, they bring it into their lives that way. I like to think it's her, her own footsteps. I handed her that board and she didn't look back. 